And thank you again for uh, being with us again this week and really excited to have our guest, Dr. Uh, Fuzz Rana with us. He's the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe. We just had his colleague, Professor Ken Samples, on last week looking at his book, uh, God Among Stages. Uh, we've been doing a lot of different talks over the past several weeks, and uh, you can find those at our Ratio Christi at Winthrop uh, YouTube page. So if you go there, you see all the talks that we've done. We're uploading there. We've got a lot of, a lot of good talks uh, still in the works. We've got Nancy Piercy who's going to be coming on and doing some uh, talks on Love Thy Body. We've got my friend Dr. Phil Fernandez who's going to come on and do a talk on the historical Jesus. Uh, as well as a debate towards the end of August this month on apologetic methodology. But not even Melissa knew about that. One. No, I'm just learning about that. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, tonight we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Rana on, and he's going to be doing a talk on uh, intelligent design. He is a he's a brilliant man. I've got several of his books there on my scientific side of the bookshelf, and. Um, you know, regardless whatever side of the issue you fall on, whether the old or old Earth or young Earth, um, you know, I'm a young Earth guy, but I have just loved Dr. Rana's work and uh, the work at Reasons to Believe, his book, uh, Who is Adam, uh, as well as The Cell's Design, and uh, I know they did one on the origins of life. Just excellent, excellent work. So couldn't recommend um, you know, the work of reasons to believe high enough. So Dr. Rana has a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio State University. He became a Christian as a graduate student studying biochemistry. Uh, the cell's complexity, elegance, and sophistication coupled with the inadequacy of evolutionary scenarios for account of life's origin compelled him to conclude life must stem from a creator. But it was only after his Beyonce's pastor challenged him to read the Bible, that he became convinced of the validity of Christ's claims and his own need for a savior. So that said, um, I want to thank the, the, uh, our good friend Ramon Margallo and his uh, friends from the Philippines joining us. Super exciting to have that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Rana. And um, what we'll do is we'll just keep the questions towards the end. And, and Dr. Rana is going to do a um, a presentation, a PowerPoint, and then uh, when he's done with that, we'll just open up uh, a time for a uh, question and answer. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Rana. Well, thank you for so much, uh, Devin and Melissa, for having me. It's good to catch up with you again. Yeah. Uh, I'm used to seeing you guys uh, in the uh, fall at the yeah. NCPA, but uh, this year, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. So, uh, I think that's going to go virtual like everything else. Uh -huh. So let me go ahead and uh, try to pull up my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. All right. Let's see here. There we go. I'm going to make you. Okay. Are you guys, are you guys seeing that? Okay. Yes, sir. All righty. Well, let's see. Do you have, okay. I see your, let's see. Is everyone, Devin, can you see it okay? All right. So well, I, see uh, the, um, I don't see the PowerPoint. I see like, your screen of why I believe God exists, and it's got like the Redux thing, but the PowerPoint itself I don't think is up. Oh, okay, because it looks like mine is says I'm sharing my screen. Is that are you seeing that? Happen? Yeah, it's sharing the screen, but your your uh, it's basically it's the view of your files. Okay, so something's gone wrong here. Let's see. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Stop, okay. Sorry about that. Let me it's stop okay. Sharing. Good old technology. Yeah. Well, plus the good old technology in the wrong hands. So here we go. <laughs> now, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Rana, did you want to maybe share with us like more of your testimony and those sort of things as well? I think that's pretty interesting. I, I sure, certainly can do that. Um, because in a sense, this idea of, uh, of you know, intelligent design actually is intertwined with, with my testimony and how I came to faith in Christ. Uh, in kind of in a nutshell, um, you know, I was a, an agnostic going into graduate school. I, you know, I didn't know if God existed and I honestly could have uh, cared less, to be quite frank. I was 
interested in science and specifically in the inner workings of the cell. And that's, you know, really what consumed, you know, air, you know, it consumed my thinking. And uh, yet as a graduate student studying biochemistry, uh, I uh, was deeply impressed uh, with what I was learning about the, the intricacies of, of biochemical systems. They, they just seemed to me to be so elegant and sophisticated uh, in, in the way they were, they were structured and there was an ingenuity to them. And that really uh, prompted me to ask questions related to how do we as scientists explain where these systems come from? And that really is the origin of life question uh, that, you know, the idea that um, a life would have uh, presumably emerged out of the, through the outworkings of chemical evolution. Uh, yet when I examined in detail those explanations at that time, the, the explanations that were offered at the time, it just didn't seem to me that those mechanisms could create the, the chemical systems we see inside the cell. And it was at that point I was convinced that there had to be a mind behind everything. Um, because, you know, what it looked to me like was these, these systems were designed. And if uh, evolutionary mechanisms couldn't account for that appearance of design, then the only reasonable explanation would be that that design must be the work of a mind. And of course, when you begin to reach that conclusion, hopefully you would ask, you know, the same questions that I ask as a graduate student, which was, who is this designer and do I relate to that designer? And to me, I felt like ultimately the best explanation for those questions was found in the Christian faith. So the, the point of, um, of sharing that is that uh, this idea of, you know, design is really a, um, not an academic exercise, but it actually has bearing on uh, how we would share our faith as Christians, because uh, I meet so many people, uh, and I actually shared this perspective myself as an undergraduate student, that if evolutionary mechanisms can explain biology, then why do you need to appeal to a creator? What role is there for a creator to play? A creator seems unnecessary. Uh, and, and so it wasn't until I saw the, the shortcomings of the evolutionary paradigm coupled with really, with to me to be clear indication that life must be designed, that there's real design in biology, that I you know, was open to the idea of a, of a creator. And then that uh, led me to questions that really um, brought me to the foot of the cross. So in other words, you can't really present a, uh, the gospel to people if they're not convinced that, that there's a creator. And unfortunately for many people that uh, have familiarity with the life sciences, uh, the mere fact that they operate under the, the view that evolution can explain everything really, again, keeps them from uh, embracing the reality of the creator and ultimately the, the reality of the gospel. So, you know, this idea of design, again, is, is really, uh, really very important. And, um, I came to faith in Christ uh, now 35 years ago. I'm getting to be kind of an old codger here these days. Uh, uh, but over the last three and a half decades, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about uh, and exploring uh, what we would call the design argument or the, the case for intelligent design. And, uh, and so what I'm going to present tonight is kind of... Uh, um, a summation of my thinking and where I'm at currently today, as I've thought about how do we go about constructing uh, a compelling design argument. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what I'll be presenting tonight. And I'll illustrate how that argument works by drawing on some insights from uh, biochemistry and from um, origin of life research and also from work in synthetic biology. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've been, kind of entitled the, the presentation this evening, Why I Believe God Exists. But in effect, I believe God exists because of, of the design argument. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. And, and the first question that I think uh, is really important to engage when you're thinking about presenting the case for design is to be able to show people that the idea of intelligent design, or more specifically, the idea of intelligent agency uh, 
is uh, it's really important to be able to show that the idea of intelligent agency is really something that can be probed uh, from a scientific perspective. Because what, what I find so often is that people are very quick to dismiss any argument for design as being essentially non-scientific. You know, they would argue, well, you know, design or intelligent design or creation really isn't part of the scientific construct. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, therefore, it, it's illegitimate to, to try to make a scientific case uh, for a creator utilizing design. And, and so because of that, I think many, you, we all need to be prepared to, to demonstrate that science actually is capable uh, of detecting the work of intelligent agency in nature. Uh, and that, that, in a sense, the idea of design can be a bona fide scientific conclusion that you would draw from the evidence at hand. And uh, I would make my appeal uh, by pointing out that there are actually areas of science that are, in effect, intelligent design uh, programs. So, for example, forensic science, the idea of crime scene investigations is essentially an intelligent design research endeavor. Uh, a, a, a detective comes uh, upon a dead body, uh, there's a crime scene, and now the detective is capable by utilizing scientific methods to determine if that individual died as a result of natural processes or if that individual died as a result of the, the activity of a malevolent intelligent agent. And in fact, by examining the crime scene, uh, detectives can actually tell you something about the capability and maybe even the motivation of the, of the malevolent agent that brought about the death of that individual. Uh, or if we turn to uh, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, this is predicated on the ability of uh, detecting in, uh, again, evidence for intelligent activity, the activity of intelligent agents uh, in, in astronomical features. And so the idea would be that if there's electromagnetic radiation emanating from some kind of distant star system, that we can, from the characteristics of that radiation, tell whether or not that was emanating from an intelligent civilization or if it reflects the, the work of some kind of natural process mechanism. Uh, or if we go to the discipline of archaeology, here again is an area where intelligent design is central. Uh, if researchers pick up a rock, uh, are they, they, they can tell if that rock was shaped through some kind of natural process or if it was actually deliberately shaped by, again, some kind of intelligent agent, let's say a hominin of some sort that would again, deliberately shape that, that object for some kind of purpose. Uh, and, and so not only, again, can we detect intelligent agency in this instance, but it, that, the, the nature of the, the, the work on the rock, the m modification of the rock tells us something about the cognitive abilities uh, of, of that uh, intelligent agent. And, and let me illustrate that in more detail by talking about an interesting archaeological site near uh, uh, San Diego, California. I live in Southern California, probably about two hours away from San Diego. And so this is a, a very important archaeological site that's uh, in my backyard of sorts. And uh, this particular site is called the Soretti Mastodon site. It was discovered in 1992 by Caltrans, who was uh, doing some kind of road work and unearthed this archaeological site. And so archaeologists came in and they, they discovered mastodon remains. And it looked as if those mastodon remains were actually processed uh, by some kind of, by, by a human. Uh, and, uh, and yet, it, uh, and so this was again, dubbed the Soretti Mastodon site. Uh, but one of the troubling issues with the site was that people were unable to date the site with radiometric dating techniques. And, uh, a couple of years ago, they figured out how to radiometrically date the site, and they discovered that the site dates at 130,000 years. Now, according to kind of the standard scientific framework, uh, modern humans didn't migrate into the Americas until probably about 13,000 years ago. So this indicated that there was some kind of 
quote unquote human activity uh, in the Americas about 120,000 years or 110,000 years uh, before modern humans made their way into this area. And so these researchers concluded that perhaps Neanderthals had migrated into the Americas and were responsible for uh, processing the, the mastodon remains. Now, this was an incredibly controversial claim on the part of the scientists who made the claim. And so in order to support this, they really did some detailed work. Uh, and so they, first of all, had to establish that actually this was a bona fide archeological site. And so the way they did this is by showing that the site had the appearance of design, that it displayed an artificiality to it. Uh, and this was based on the arrangement of the mastodon bones uh, and the cobble, the rocks that presumably were used to process the bones. It looked like someone was trying to get the marrow out of the bones. And they also noted markings on the bone and the cobble that didn't appear to be to, due to natural processes. It appeared to be, again, due to deliberate activity. So the, the first thing they did is they established that the site actually displayed the appearance of design, looking again at, at, at artificiality as a criteria. Uh, they then went about eliminating any kind of natural process explanation, like scavengers uh, actually uh, working on the remains of a, of a dead mastodon, and as a result of that, producing the arrangement of cobble and bones. And they, they excluded this as being a reasonable explanation. And then they went into the lab and they actually took the, the, remain, the femur of, of, of an elephant, the femur of a, a cow, and they took the same kind of rocks that were at the site and they basically struck those, those freshly pr uh, produced femurs from, again, elephant and cow cadavers, showing that they could make identical markings on the, on the rock and on the bones as they found in the archeological site. So they, in other words, they reproduced that design in the lab and showed uh, that intelligent agency was critical to again, produce those kind of markings. And so in a sense, they established for us a criteria that we could use to construct a design argument. And it really is a threefold criteria. Uh, again, the appearance of design, uh, uh, the, the failure of natural processes to account for that design, and then uh, showing that intelligent agency is, is necessary to create that appearance of design. So these are the three criteria they used. And when it comes to uh, making a case for design in biochemistry, we can utilize those three criteria by making a case case that biochemical systems have the appearance of design by showing that, that chemical evolution can't explain the origin of that design. And then also by uh, looking at what does it take to try to replicate biochemical systems uh, in, in a laboratory setting, uh, the types of systems we would see inside the cell. And then finally, um, uh, there's an additional uh, line of argumentation that we could bring to bear uh, beyond what our archaeologists would do, and that is to actually show uh, that uh, a, a creation model or a design approach to biology actually provides a, a productive framework for the development of new technologies. And the reason why this last criteria is important has to relate to the pragmatic theory of truth. Uh, I actually gave a message at our church this weekend on, on, on truth. And kind of how does the, how do people in our culture at large think about truth and what is the biblical perspective on truth? And as part of that, uh, I, I, I delineated different models for uh, what truth consists of. And one of those models is the pragmatic theory of truth. That is, you assess whether or not something is true by putting it into practice. And if it works, then that gives you reason to think that that idea that you're embracing is actually true. And so, in other words, if we actually believe that there was a mind behind uh, the design that we see in living systems, then we should be able to take that conclusion and treat it as a true statement and then put it into practice. And if it works, then that gives us more reason to think that that idea, that conclusion that we arrived at regarding design and biology is true. Because if, if there's a mind behind 
the designs in biology, then those designs should actually inspire a new technology. They can be a, a model for a technology. And indeed they are. So anyway, these are, this is how we can go about constructing a design argument. So let's take a look at the first uh, criteria, the appearance of design. And one of the things that uh, struck me, as I mentioned, as a graduate student was the ingenuity and the elegance and the sophistication of biochemical systems. To me, they looked as if they were, uh, again, the work of a mind. They looked like they were designed. But one of the projects that I've been working on uh, the last three decades is how do we take that intuition of design that almost everybody has when they look at biochemical systems and formalize that intuition into the, into, in, of design into a formal case for design. And, and I believe that the way we can go about doing this is to revitalize the watchmaker argument of William Paley. Uh, the more that I think about Paley's work and his, and his watchmaker argument, the more I'm impressed with the ingenuity of the argument. Uh, uh, but the idea here is that when we look at biochemical systems and, and what we understand about biochemical systems, they, they bear certain attributes that you would call their hallmark characteristics or their hallmark features. These are definitive features that, that again, are representative of the nature of biochemical systems, about the essence of these systems. And it turns out that these features are identical to the features that we would recognize as the work of a human designer. In other words, when human beings design, create, invent, those systems that we create have, a, have an artificiality to them. They possess certain attributes or certain properties that we immediately recognize as the work of a mind. And by analogy, we see those same uh, features defining biochemical systems. And so we would uh, argue that it's reasonable to conclude that those systems too must be the work of a mind. Uh, and on top of that, there are also biochemical systems that in their totality also bear, again, a, a remarkable, in fact, an eerie similarity to man-made uh, machines, uh, to man-made systems. And again, we can use uh, analogical reasoning to conclude that these systems uh, in the cell must be the work of a mind because of the similarity they bear to human designs. This, again, is in effect the watchmaker argument. Uh, where um, uh, Paley argued in, in his book, uh, Natural Theology, that uh, a watch, which in his day was the pinnacle of engineering achievement, uh, clearly is the work of a watchmaker. And Paley argued that we arrive at that conclusion because that watch has certain properties, again, that reflect the work of a mind. And so P Paley argued that by analogy, when we look at biological systems, they seem to have uh, features that again are shared with, uh, with a watch, with the attributes of a watch that to, to, to us reflect the work of a mind and therefore life must have the work, must be the work of a mind as well. And so what we can do is with the insights from biochemistry, in a sense, revitalize the watchmaker argument, give it, uh, give it a new focus, uh, uh, which are the biochemical systems in the cell. But again, we can revitalize that argument. And just to illustrate this, um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, uh, about DNA and about the, 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 the machinery in the cell that manipulates DNA during processes like DNA replication or transcription or DNA repair. A DNA is, a, is an information storage molecule. And the information stored in DNA is uh, digital information. It, it exists in a digital format. And of course, the information in DNA is essentially the set of instructions that the cell's machinery uses to build all of its component parts uh, and to also direct the operation of those component parts. And so DNA is essentially uh, the, the operating instructions, if you will, for the cell. And again, it's, it's in a digital format. And it turns out that, again, the cell's machinery that manipulates DNA during a number of critical a me metabolic processes is literally operating like a computer system. Uh, and and uh, the person who had this original insight uh, was a, shown in this picture. This is Leonard Adelman, who is a computer scientist at the University of Southern California. And, and the similarity between uh, the way, again, the cell's machinery manipulates DNA 
and again, the operation of, com of a computer system is so stark that, that it inspired Adelman uh, to, uh, to essentially build uh, DNA computers, where he, he built the very first DNA computer utilizing DNA and again, the, the, the protein components in the cell that manipulate DNA. And these computers are housed in these little tiny Eppendorf test tubes that are about this big. Uh, and they're more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer system that we've ever built. Uh, and, and there's a number of technical reasons why that's the case. But this is literally now a, a, an, a, an entire area of nanotechnology that, is a, a, that very well may represent a very important technology as we go into the future where we, we very well may have a computing systems that again are wet systems built around uh, again the DNA molecule. Uh, but we know from our experience that, that, that computers come from a mind, right? That in fact they come from an ensemble of humans working together uh, to produce computers. That computers are the pinnacle of engineering achievement in our day. And nobody in their right mind would argue that computers uh, are the product of, of unguided uh, natural processes, but rather we recognize them as the work of a mind because of the attributes that they possess. And so uh, if, if we know that computers come from the work of a mind and we see that computers are central to the cell's operation, then is that not evidence that too, the cell is the work of a mind as well? This is what Leonard Adelman says about DNA computing. And as you as you, you, as you think about this, this statement of Adelman, think about this in light of the watchmaker argument, where Adelman says the most important thing about DNA computing is that it shows that DNA molecules can do what we normally think only computers can do. This implies that computer science and biology are closely related, that every living thing can be thought to be computing something, and that sometimes we can understand living things better by looking at them as computers. Now, the, the, re, the rejoinder to this particular uh, argument for design uh, is the blind watchmaker uh, re rebuttal uh, with the idea that, yes, indeed, there's, there's this incredible uh, and impressive appearance of design in biochemical systems. Nobody disputes that. But uh, many people argue would argue that that design is ultimately the product of evolutionary processes. And, in, and when we talk about biochemical systems, we're really talking about chemical evolution here, not biological evolution. But nevertheless, the argument would be that, that evolutionary mechanisms are responsible for that design, that if there is a, a watchmaker, it is the blind watchmaker of natural selection. So this idea is beautifully expressed by Richard Dawkins, who said, Paley had the proper reference for the complexity of the living world, and he saw that it demands a very special kind of explanation. The only thing he got wrong was the explanation itself. The true explanation had to wait for Charles Darwin. Natural selection, the blind and conscious automatic process, which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of a watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker. And this is why the second uh, element of the design argument that I, that I suggested is really so important, that, that once we establish the appearance of design, we have to go the next step and demonstrate that that appearance of design is actually authentic design, that it's not uh, design produced through natural selection. And so here, that brings us to an evaluation of evolutionary explanations now for the origin of biochemical systems. And, uh, and, I, and, and it, this is uh, this, the idea that uh, we don't have an explanation for the origin of life from an evolutionary perspective is not a controversial statement. No matter what a person's worldview is, if they have any familiarity with the origin of life problem, they will readily acknowledge we don't know how life originates through chemical evolution, that this is one of the grand mysteries of science today. Uh, but there's good reason why people don't know uh, how life originates and how biochemical systems 
uh, acquire the appearance of design through evolutionary mechanisms. And that's because every attempt to try to account for the origin of life has, has been has met with met a dead end. And there are three broad approaches that people have explored for the origin of life, replicator first, metabolism first, and membrane first scenarios. And you don't necessarily need to know the specifics of these at this juncture. If you want to know where you can go to dig deeper, uh, I can recommend some places you can begin your, your, your in-depth in study. But simply know this is that no matter the approach, everything again winds up as a dead end. Uh, Leslie Orgel, uh, who when he was alive was one of the world's leading authorities on the origin of life, uh, said this about replicator first scenarios, that it would be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive earth. And here, uh, Orgel is referring to the RNA world scenario, which is the, the leading replicator first model for the origin of life. That Orgel argued that it would, again, be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive earth. Orgel was a committed atheist, but what he was pointing out here is that the problems are so severe that you, necess that you might as well be appealing to a miracle to explain the origin of life. With regard to metabolism first scenarios, uh, Orgel said this, Metab metabolism first scenarios would require an appeal to magic, a series of remarkable coincidences, a near miracle. Uh, and then with regard to membrane first scenarios, a few years ago, I published the paper along with another chemist by the name of Jackie Thomas uh, in an Origin of Life journal where we showed that membrane first scenarios are, are again, are confronted with some very serious problems that really raise questions as, as to whether or not these are legitimate explanations or legitimate models for the origin of life. Uh, now, and so, here we, we, we've met the second criteria in our design argument, namely that it doesn't look like natural processes can explain the design in biochemical systems. Now that leads us in effect to the third criteria. And this is really a very important criteria that, that shouldn't be overlooked uh, because the, the rejoinder that I've often heard from original life researchers is that they will readily agree that we don't know, again, how life originates through chemical evolution. But they would argue that, look, we can go in the lab and we can do some interesting things in the labs, uh, simulating the conditions of the early earth. And under these simulations, we can do some neat things it's like a bit, identify chemical pathways that can form the building blocks of life, or we can make biopolymers that and we can even involve them in the lab to carry out a wide range of functions. And we can create self-replicating systems and even manufacture protocells. And, and while these don't necessarily explain how life originates, they represent pieces of the puzzle. They, they represent kind of clues uh, to, to, the, to the origin of life problem. And this is where the, the third criteria becomes so important, namely the idea that we can go in the lab and actually um, uh, evaluate what does it take to actually uh, to do these kinds of experiments? What does it take for us to try to uh, create life or at least biochemical systems uh, in the laboratory? And uh, what, we, what we can point out is that yes, indeed, uh, we can go in the lab and we can, again, do some very interesting experiments that seem to have at, in, in, at, the, at first reaction of some profound significance in terms of supporting scientifically the idea of chemical evolution. Uh, but when we begin to think about these results, we recognize very quickly that, that while, we, while at one hand these experiments do represent success of sorts for a, a chemical evolutionary scenario, on the other hand, they also expose a really significant, in fact, an intractable problem. Namely, that it's one thing to be able to do chemistry in a laboratory. It's another thing for that chemistry that you've identified in the laboratory to actually be productive under the conditions of the early earth. And, and, and what I mean by that is this, that think about this. In a lab, you have researchers that are setting up a, a, chem, a, a, you know, a glass apparatus, an experimental apparatus that they're going to run a, a chemical reaction in. They so carefully select the, the solvent. 
they carefully select the atmospheric conditions of that reaction uh, apparatus. Uh, they add the right chemicals at the right time and the right concentrations. They are very careful to exclude other chemicals that could pr in principle be present on the early earth, but would interfere with the chemistry in the laboratory. So these are carefully excluded. That is, the, the, the experiments are done under well-defined chemically pristine conditions. The reactions are stopped at the right time, so the reactions don't proceed uh, beyond the desired step or the de desired stage in the reaction. And so in other words, you have researchers that have unintentionally involved themselves into the experimental design where their role as an intelligent agent has actually contributed to the successful outcome of the experiment. And, and, and the oversight of organic chemists on the early earth simply wouldn't, be, wouldn't exist. And, and so therefore, the conditions of the early earth are not actually replicated in the laboratory. Uh, but what these rab laboratory experiments are doing, ironically, is demonstrating the critical role of an intelligent agent. And, and I can illustrate this by talking about a, a very well-known uh, collection of experiments that were, that were initially done in the mid-1990s and, and are actually continued today uh, in the laboratories of origin of life research, researchers. And this is the assembly of RNA molecules on clay surfaces. And this was considered to be a landmark accomplishment um, uh, for the origin of life scenario, because the idea would be, well, if there were clays or other minerals on the early earth, that these could sequester and concentrate building block materials, and then uh, the clay could serve as a catalyst that would drive the formation of RNA polymers. Uh, and, and so therefore, this experiment really lends credibility uh, to, the, to the RNA world and to replicator first areas. The problem is, is that when you uh, examine these experiments that were done, uh, what you see is that, again, these were done under chemically pristine conditions uh, where you have excluded uh, from the reaction materials that would interfere with the growth of the RNA chains, would, would cause their, the RNA chains to undergo hydrolysis. Uh, and, and so therefore, uh, uh, you know, essentially represents an unrealistic set of conditions in the laboratory because these interfering uh, materials would have been present at high levels on the early earth and would have prevented the formation of RNA molecules. Moreover, these researchers stop the reaction once the RNA chains get to a certain length, because if they got actually longer, they would become irreversibly absorbed onto the surface of the clay, and, and, and that would then uh, uh, render them useless in an original life scenario. But then also these researchers actually had to buy the clay in their experiment from a particular supplier. Only clay from that supplier actually works. Uh, as a catalyst, they had to uh, treat the clay in a very special way so that it would, again, serve as a catalyst. And then they had to use chemically modified building blocks that, because of that modification, were much more reactive. And so, in other words, the researchers rigged the system through, uh, through design to produce RNA polymers. And that, that what they did in the lab was completely irrelevant to the conditions of the early Earth. Simon Conway Morris in his book, Life Solution said, many of the experiments designed to explain one or other step in the origin of life are either of tenuous relevance to any believable prebiotic setting or involve an experimental rig in which the hand of the researcher becomes for all intents and purposes the hand of God. Uh, or we have, uh, uh, so, so in other words, when we go in the lab and we try to uh, create life or create biochemical systems, we recognize that intelligent agency is critical. So in other words, using the watchmaker argument, we can show that biochemical systems have the appearance of design. Uh, we can easily demonstrate that chemical evolution can't explain the origin of life and hence the origin of biochemical systems. And we can actually show that again, from work in, uh, in, in the laboratory where scientists are trying to create life in the lab, that intelligent agency is necessary. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so last but not least, uh, again, uh, the final point that I would like to make that I think contributes 
uh, to the design argument as well, is the idea that uh, intelligent design not only is legitimately part of the construct of science, at least when it comes to, again, uh, forensic science and study and archaeology, and I would even extend that when it even comes to um, uh, uh, biochemistry, but that actually intelligent design uh, is, is undergirds uh, uh, technology, uh, biotechnology. So work in synthetic biology where scientists are trying to create artificial organisms in the lab, either through genetic engineering or through a bottom-up approach uh, through chemical engineering, uh, is an intelligent design program. Or the idea of using designs in biology to inspire new technologies, this is an area called biomimetics and bioinspiration, is also an intelligent design program. So in other words, uh, adding to the credibility of intelligent design and, and the case for design is the idea that design is actually a very productive way to think about science and about um, biology, and that, that, that it works, that it works, that it can lead to new technologies. So, uh, uh, and, and the whole idea behind uh, uh, biomimetics and bioinspiration is that while it, it naturally flows out of a creation model or an intelligent design framework, Biomimetics and bioinspiration really fits very poorly within an evolutionary framework. Because if you believe that, the, that evolutionary processes are in guided, undirected, and blind, as most biologists think, and that evolution effect, in, in effect involves co-opting existing designs and modifying them and cobbling them together to create new designs, that these kind of systems are inherently flawed. They're inherently imperfect. Uh, uh, Ken Miller, in an article for Technology Review, said this, evolution does not produce perfection. The fact that every intermediate stage in the development of an organ must confer a selective advantage means that the simplest and most elegant design for an organ cannot always be produced by evolution. In fact, the hallmark of evolution is the modification of pre-existing structures. An evolved organism, in short, should show telltale signs of this modification. And so, and so we don't expect evolution to produce perfection. But if it doesn't produce perfection, if it produces these flawed, imperfect systems, then why would anybody in their right mind turn to these designs to inspire technology? But if they indeed, are, these designs in biology and biochemistry are the work of the mind, then we would naturally uh, turn to these systems and look to them to be productive uh, and, and as, as a source of productive insight into, into how we can develop technology, where the technology we develop now is a mimic or a copy of the technology that the creator introduced into the creation uh, to begin with. So in other words, evolution produces kludge systems uh, and uh, in light of that, again, is it reasonable to think that biochemical systems really represent the outworking of unguided, historically contingent processes that co-op pre-existing designs to kludge together new systems? Is that really reasonable? So anyway, that, that'll uh, end um, my uh, formal presentation. And, and what I wanted to really, I, I think, communicate to you most of all isn't so much a kind of a, a a cookie cutter argument for design, or I didn't want to really provide you with just kind of a set of silver bullets that you could use uh, to, to argue for design, but I really wanted to give you kind of a, a framework or a methodology for constructing a design argument that, that to me, I think, again, represents um, a, an approach that uh, is, is, is a bona fide scientific approach, modeling the, the argument after what uh, scientists in, in archaeology do uh, as an example. Uh, it, because again, once you're able to construct that argument in a framework that, again, is consistent with what is done in science, then you've eliminated one of the uh, common objections to the design argument that in, in effect doesn't belong uh, in science or that it's illegitimate to use science to make a case for design because design is philosophy, or it's theology, but it's, it's not science. 
uh, by using the, the same methodology as archaeologists use, you essentially, again, dis are able to, to dismiss uh, that objection and then force people to really confront the, the actual evidence for design. Okay, I'm at this point happy to, to take any questions that you guys uh, might have um, about, um, about intelligent design or anything relating to, to science and, and the Christian faith. If I could, would be willing to broaden the, the Q&A to be uh, uh, beyond that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. What a, what a great talk. We've got a lot of people on, uh, on this call. So <clears throat> anybody who would like to speak to Dr. Ron or have a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, do that. I have a question. Um, so can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, when you were talking about the origin of life and you talked about the three different ways that they've tried to like, you know, set or make life or make the pre correct preconditions for life. So I, my understanding, so feel free to correct my, if I misunderstood this, but it seemed almost like it was arguing that because these different ways didn't work, then we could insert God in order the intelligent designer into the origin of life. So could you kind of explain because my interpretation of that, that's almost like a God of the gaps argument where it's like, well, because certain scientific ways of trying to explain this don't work, that we kind of insert God into this. So like, how would that not be like a God of the gaps? Yeah, uh, way more? That, that's a great, that's a great question. Oh, actually, and I also see that the chat is active too. So if anybody wants to ask a question or post a comment on the chat, I'll take a look at that. Uh, yeah, that's a great question that you're, you're bringing up. And I would agree with you that if my argument tonight was basically, we cannot explain uh, the origin of life through chemical evolution, that everything that we've tried up to this point has led to a dead end. Therefore, the origin of life must be the product of a creator. I would argue that that is a God of the, a God of the gaps argument, or at minimum, it's a negative argument for design in that we've eliminated natural process explanations and therefore we conclude that it's design but i would much rather prefer making a positive case for design and this is why i, I talked about again how archaeologists go about establishing uh, the design that uh, that a, a particular artifact at a, a site is actually de has been designed by a hominin or by uh, a modern human uh, and that, that criteria, again, is first of all establishing that it has a bona fide appearance of design, that it, it displays an artificiality to it. Uh, and, and then also this is why the third criteria is important. What does it take to produce that particular feature? Uh, and and if it, again, if we show that intelligent agency is required, then those two elements of the, of the argument actually move it away from a god of the gaps argument or a negative argument to a positive argument that is not based on, uh, again, the inability of evolution to explain it, but is, is based on the, the features that in the, the characteristics that that system possesses, as well as what we now understand it to take in order to produce those kind of features. You, you see what I'm saying? So in other words, that's why those other two criteria are so important. Uh, and, and oftentimes, I see uh, apologists tend to make uh, an argument for design that is, is, is singular and focused, and it's primarily focusing on uh, what evolution can or can't do, as opposed to actually making a positive case for design. But on the other hand, if you just made a watchmaker argument, which is a, a positive argument, then that, that argument is vulnerable to the blind watchmaker challenge. Right, so each one of these uh, approaches that I presented uh, in and of themselves can be used to, be, to argue for design, but they all three have weaknesses or limitations. And so the idea of combining them together uh, allows you to take advantage of the strength of each of those approaches and also allows you to offset or compensate for the weaknesses. And, and so therefore you're able to make a, a robust case for design and again, what you're doing when you conclude design is, 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 the same, is drawing the same kind of 
a, a, a conclusion or inference that somebody as an archaeologist would, would draw if they were presented with the same, again, same set of conclusions, right? Or same set of sub-conclusions. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I'm not super well versed in this, so I'll need to like look a little more, but I get, I get where you're tracking, like that makes sense. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm from the Philippines, and uh, together with my uh, with, uh, with a friend with, uh, with a friend of mine came from the Philippines. Uh, lately, we have received in the news that uh, that uh, there's someone he's giving a petition in the Philippine Congress about uh, abortion. So uh, the battle that you are facing right now in the West is already catching up with us, and. Uh, and uh, the question that uh, all of us Filipino, Filipino evangelicals in the Philippines is that how can we build a case for pro-life perspective as evangelicals? How can we strengthen more on pro-life? And um, and uh, we are we are currently on the on the uh, um, on this issue right now in the Philippines, and uh, especially uh, uh, we've done a Nasogi bill, but not today. It's a it's a petition on abortion. So how can we make a case for that? Thank you. Yeah, um, you know I I, I uh, am, am pro life like you, and uh, you know uh, I would actually, but I don't I don't spend a lot of effort as part of my work in ministry with reasons to believe uh, advancing. Um, kind of a, the pro-life agenda, not because our organization, again, doesn't in, in hold to a pro-life perspective. It's just that we've decided that our focus as a ministry really should be on more um, on, on science faith issues, recognizing that there's uh, some very good uh, organizations out there that uh, have done very good work in terms of advancing the, the, the pro-life case. Um, and, and so, for example, uh, uh, Scott Klusendorf is somebody that I would commend that you might check out. Um, he, he's done an excellent job uh, as an evangelical making a pro-life case. But uh, to me, just, just some thoughts. Uh, and again, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that I've, I've got, again, the, the type of expertise that I think you're, you're, you're seeking after. Uh, but to me, you know, as a biochemist, I've yet to come across any kind of evidence that would convince me that, that at the point of fertilization, that, that, that the zygote is anything other than a unique human individual. And, and you know, to me, the, one of the tactics that you see taken by a people that hold to a pro-life, uh, sorry, so a, a pro-choice position is to employ this concept of personhood, that yes, indeed, that, that embryo may be a human embryo, but it's not a human person, where they try to, to divorce personhood from, uh, you know, the, the, the biological uh, humanness of, uh, of the zygote. And when they would argue that, again, personhood uh, is a quality that, you know, would, would emerge at some point during the course of embryological development, or maybe even at the time of birth, or maybe even w within some period of the within some window of the first two years of life or something like that, where they would couple the, the, the idea of sentience and self-awareness to, to the, the idea of personhood. And, and to me, I think the, the first point I would make is that the, the concept of personhood is a very, is an ill-defined arbitrary concept that, that nobody can produce an adequate definition of, of what personhood is or what, is, what sentience is uh, or how would you, you would go about measuring it if you indeed could actually define it? And, and uh, can something be partially sentient or can something be partially a person or not? You know, uh, and if it is, at what point does the, the, do the scales tip in favor of, again, treating that now as a, as a human individual that's afforded human rights and, and dignity and, and worth and value? So to me, the concept of personhood is arbitrary. Uh, and I remember actually having a, 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 a debate of sorts with a, an atheist about this very issue. And, and I brought up the point, it's like, well, what, what's keeping me from def defining a person uh, as, as, a, as a human being that's two years old, two years old or older? What, what prevents me from doing that? I could produce a definition 
uh, where I could argue that maybe an infant actually doesn't have sentience or it doesn't have self-awareness. Uh, and, and in this, he, he, you know, he had no real response to that, right? So I think that's, that's something that I, uh, I, I think you want to really drive home is, again, how arbitrary and how meaningless the concept of personhood is. And, and because genetically at the point of fertilization, that zygote is a unique human individual and uh, under normative circumstances in, in the environment of the womb, that, that single celled zygote will develop into a fully formed human being, fully formed in a biological sense. That is that that, 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 that zygote is on a trajectory uh, towards, again, developing into a fully formed human being. And what abortion is doing is disrupting that trajectory. It's disrupting that, that process, uh, uh, you know, towards, again, uh, the full formation and the full growth and development into a human individual. But again, uh, because there, there are these intermediate steps from the zygote to a, you know, a fully developed individual. And by the way, you know, brain development continues well into, uh, you know, well into probably adolescence, maybe even beyond adolescence. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the process of growth and development doesn't stop at the point of birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, because human beings have such a large brain size relative to our body, the only way that, that a, 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 you know, a, a human female can actually give birth is for most of the brain development to actually happen uh, within the, within, uh, happen after birth. And a lot of brain development happens within the first two years of life. So if you compare, for example, the brain of a chimpanzee at birth with the brain of a, of a modern human, the chimp brain is about 80% the size that it's going to be um, uh, once that chimp is, is fully grown. For humans, it's only 20%. So, so you know, the idea that what happens outside the womb or the, that the, the point of birth now somehow defines personhood too, again, betrays the biology. So, so to me, I think genetically, the, the embryo is a unique human individual. There's, I don't know how you could argue anything else other than that. And, and again, just because there's a developmental process doesn't mean that during the course of the development that that embryo should lack any kind of value or worth. Uh, because it, it's not a, that those intermediate stages are not, uh, you know, are not stopping points in that process. It's a continuum uh, that goes on again well into the, the, the first decade or maybe two of life. That's great, um, Dr. Rana. And also, um, so, for those who. I, I, I don't know if that's I, been I helpful. Think I, got, to you like, or not. I think I got this right now. Um, in order for us to really establish a defense. On the, on the subject of life and the, because life is also science, right? So life is also about science. Uh, we need to establish the, we need to establish the scientific definitions when it comes to defending life in the evangelical perspective. So I think, um, I, think that's, I, I think that's the summary of what you are just saying. So thank you for encouraging us <laughs> to really, uh, to really uh, pursue the fight for life. Yeah, and there's a couple of qu questions about, please stay on the, on the, questions on uh, well, keep the questions on the topic thank you today. so much thank you so well no much. It, was, yeah, so. it was a great it was a great question also um for those who are local here in the um south carolina rock hill area um joanne fowler's on the line and she's actually the executive director at palmetto women's center here in our city and she does a lot of work with women who are abortion minded and um, offering a lot of resources so those of you who are local and um either would like to maybe volunteer or you know someone in a position like that um definitely send them to Joanne. So they, they're they a great, great, great ministry. Um, there was a question here in the chat that I wanted to throw out before I take another yeah, question. Paul, here. contact me because what the person that, that Fuzz mentioned, Scott Kusendorf. Yes. He has complete training program. Absolutely. You can, get, you can get, I think you can get all that online. So email uh, me and I'll uh, make sure uh, I connect uh, it. Thank you. But the, 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 uh, but the encouragements itself that I received today is, uh, is enough for me to say that uh, we need to make a stand on life 
and uh, we need to base it on science. Scott, so thank Scott you, has thank those you. resources. That's his, that's his theme. He pounds the table. It's science, it's science, it's science. Yeah. Um, let me jump to a question here in the chat um, before we jump to another question in the room. Um, would there be evidence that leads us to believe that it's only our God, the Christian God, responsible for this design? Yeah, that, that's a, um, a good question. And in fact, um, uh, at our website, reasons.org, I, I wrote a little blog piece a few years ago called, uh, or entitled something like, Can Science Identify the Designer? And, and the point that I made is that when you look at uh, the, the totality of the scientific evidence, you can actually, I think, uh, get somebody to the point where they would recognize that the, the designer is, uh, uh, is compatible with it being the God of the Bible. I don't think you can, from science, demonstrate that it is the God of the Bible, uh, but you can at least, I think, move people in that direction. So, for example, you know, astronomers have discovered that at least the local universe that we are a part of had a beginning, so that matter, energy, space, and time have, have a singularity beginning, which means that there is a cause that's outside the universe that brought the universe into existence. So once you start talking about a transcendent cause, you're now talking about, again, um, uh, I think a God that would be represented by theism. And, and uh, we, from the design of the universe, the design that we see in biological and biochemical systems, we can conclude by the appearance of design that that whenever you see design, that, that means that there's a personality because design implies uh, intentionality, implies purpose. And so that means that that transcendent cause is likely uh, personal. Uh, we, we see that the, the laws of nature are fixed. So that is consistent with the biblical view of God, who is a God who is uh, unchanging, uh, a God who uh, is a God of, uh, of, of righteousness. Uh, the fact that we see again the law, the universe uh, conforming to the laws of nature, that there's a regularity to the universe. Uh, you know, when when it comes to the similarity between human designs and biochemical designs, uh, one way to explain why the designs that we make as human beings are similar uh, to the designs that we see in nature is that if indeed we are made in God's image then there would be a resonance between our mind and the human mind. So that's another way that you can move uh, the design argument towards, uh, at least uh, towards Christian theism, or at least Judeo, uh, kind of a Judeo-Christian perspective. Uh, the fact that we see, uh, uh, when we look at biological systems, the fact that we see a universality to biochemistry, a universality to many of the, 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 the designs in biology, suggests that there's a single designer, not multiple designers. That was one of Hume's critiques of the design argument is how do you know there's not a, a, a multitude of designers? How do you know that it's a single designer? Well, I think one way you could uh, determine that is by the fact that the, the designs that we see in nature, again, are shared designs. There's, a, again, a universality to them. So, so if you think about a little bit about the features that you see in nature, you can begin to, to construct the attributes uh, of the creator. And of course, this is biblical, right? Because uh, scripture teaches that not only is God revealed through the record of nature, that we can ascertain aspects of God's attributes from nature as well. Uh, and, and, and so that being the case, we should be able to, again, um, I think, uh, bring people to the point where they recognize that, that what we're dealing with here is a transcendent personal creator who uh, has, again, uh, is, is a creator that is unchanging, that's not capricious. Uh, and, and that would actually, dis that, the, the constancies of the laws of nature, in my opinion, actually distinguish that, that transcendent personal creator from the God of Islam. Because in Islam, Allah is capricious. Uh, and, and part of the reason why uh, science was born in, in the Islamic context at but, but essentially fizzled out or, or died out was because of the capricious nature of Allah and the idea that, that um, all one could know is what Allah wills and what Allah wills is what Allah wills. That, it, that there's a, 
an, an, an element of capriciousness to Allah. And if that's the case, then there's no confidence that anyone would have that the laws of nature tomorrow are going to be the same as the laws of nature today. And that is an assumption that is foundational to science. And it's, a fa it's an assumption that flows out of the Christian worldview and the, and the character of God, the character of the creator, who, because of his unchanging nature, because he's not a, a God who is deceptive, means that what we see in nature is reliable and what we see today will be what we see tomorrow, that we have confidence in that. And so that actually can move us towards, again, the, the God of uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian God as opposed to the God of Islam. So hopefully that gives you some sense for how you could go about uh, uh, pushing people away from a nebulous concept of design and the nebulous concept of a mind to something that's much more compatible with Christian theism. Uh, excuse me. And then, you know, ultimately, though, you know, I, I think the, the real argument that we have for uh, the, the Christian perspective on God is, is, the, is the person of Christ and the, and the historical argument we can make for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, because with that argument in, in play, coupled with the scientific argument, I think you really do have a solid case without ever turning to scripture that it probably is, or, or, or minimally tapping into scripture that probably what you're looking at uh, when, when it comes to the, the evidence for design is indeed the God of the Bible. Okay, thank you for that. That's a great explanation. Was that, um, Cornell, was that satisfactory or did you have any follow-up or did that kind of answer your question? I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna assume that means yes. Um, so we have a question from Dr. Heiner. Um, who's on I'm this. sorry. I think it would be a nice, uh, Based for more research that would uh, lead people to believe that it's not uh, pantheism that we're talking about here, but it's really the, the, the whole of the heavens and the whole of creation is actually talking about the God, the, the God who redeems. That, mm -hmm. That's my point. Maybe, maybe we can jump up from. Uh, the, the discussions about uh, the designer to a redeemer. Uh, further research may prove that uh, there is evidence in biosciences that will lead us to that conclusion, I guess. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so Dr. Heiner, Amanda Heiner, she's on the line with us, um, uh, one of our professors at Winthrop, and she has a question. Um, uh, is the acknowledgement of intelligent design growing in the secular scientific community or decreasing and why? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Um, um, I, I'm really not sure how to answer that because uh, I, I do see more and more people in the scientific community who are highly sympathetic to the idea of intelligent design. Uh, and, uh, but many of them actually operate kind of, in a, uh, uh, kind of in the closet. So if you know who they are and you look at the work that they're doing, it's very clear that through their work, they're trying to advance the ID program, but they would never uh, acknowledge that publicly because of the, uh, unfortunately, because of the backlash against people that espouse that perspective. And, and, and the idea of design that you see being explored by people in the scientific community isn't necessarily just limited to the types of, uh, of uh, the way that I've framed the design uh, argument today, uh, where you see a lot of people even exploring kind of a, a version of design where they actually see uh, God rigging the evolutionary process from the very get-go to, to drive it towards particular endpoints. And so there's some people who are design, uh, design um, sympathizers who wouldn't nece necessarily be opposed to the evolutionary framework, but actually see built into the evolutionary framework uh, uh, essentially particular endpoints uh, towards, de towards design or 
uh, towards uh, the designs that we see. So Simon Conway Morse would be somebody like that. Uh, another person is Stephen Freeland, uh, he's a, who's a biochemist. Uh, and so that's a more respectable version of, of design where they, they're really seeing a, a strong teleolo teleology to the evolutionary process. Uh, and, and so this is not your garden variety uh, theistic evolution where you're saying God just used evolution to create, but rather they're saying that there's something built into the very design of the universe that constrains uh, the evolutionary process to predetermined endpoints. Uh, and those predetermined endpoints are highly optimal and they're endpoints that are ideally fit or ideally suited for life itself. Uh, and so there's a, that's a, a school of thought that's beginning to gain some traction as, as I see it in the scientific community. But generally speaking, uh, if, if you hear a scientist say intelligent design, inv invariably they're gonna spit to get the, that horrible taste out of their mouth right after they say that, right? Because uh, ID or intelligent design is still uh, very, um, it's still, you know, uh, rejected, in a, in a broadly rejected by the scientific community at large, where they actually do indeed see it as, as a pseudo-scientific endeavor, which I think, again, is, is really sad. It's really unfortunate, but th that's, the nature, uh, that's the nature of reality. So, so in, in a sense, it, it, the, the, you know, people are not necessarily embracing intelligent design openly, but I'm seeing a growing number of scholars who are flirting with that idea, but they're flirting with it kind of on the, on the down low. Awesome, great, great answer. Um, let's see here. Um, there is another question, okay. Daniel um, asked, and I think if, I'm trying to understand your question, Daniel, I think, does our behavior inherit, inherit it from DNA mutation? maybe something along the lines of our behavior and um, DNA mutation, yeah. Yeah, I'm um, not quite sure I know what, um, what you're getting at that, but, but let me, um, it, it, if you, Daniel, if you wanna a ask a follow-up question in the chat, go ahead and do that. But let me answer the question in the way that I think you're asking it. Uh, and, and maybe I could broaden the question to, to ask, you know, is there kind of a, a, a biological basis to, to our behavior or to our, our identity as, as individual human beings? And I actually think that, that the answer to that is yes. That, that I, you know, I have, I'm a, a dualist. I think we have both an, a material and an immaterial nature. But I think it's really important to recognize that in Christian theology, and I'm, I'm willing for people who are trained in theology to jump in here and correct me if I make a misstep because I'm just a biochemist. But my understanding is in Christian theology, the view of the, of the, human, of the human is not that we are a ghost in the machine, but rather we are an integrated entity where we have a, a physical and an immaterial nature. And those, that physical and that immaterial nature are actually intertwined. And so for me, I see uh, the brain as being uh, kind of a, the, 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 the physical, a physical aspect of our being, but I see the mind as being immaterial. And I would actually even add to that, that there really is, uh, uh, that we also have a, a spirit as well, where you might want to think of the spirit and the mind as being distinct, but actually then intertwining, uh, you know, to form the soul. You know, so that may be one way to think about it. Uh, but the idea would be that, that there's, a, again, a, an immaterial aspect uh, to our nature, but that immaterial aspect is integrated with um, uh, our physical aspect. So uh, that being the case, then uh, some kind of uh, alarm is going off in the house. I'm sorry, hopefully that's not too distracting. Uh, but, uh, so, but the idea then would be that, um, that what, what happens to our biology can uh, impact our, our our behavior can impact our personality, uh, but also what happens to us in a, in a spiritual sense can also impact our behavior, can impact our personality as well because of the integration. 
Uh, so one way to think about this would be as an analogy would be like a computer hardware and a computer, you know, computer software where a computer system has to have both the hardware and the software to operate. And so if you think of the hardware as being like our brain, the software being like our, our soul or the immaterial aspect of our nature, uh, if there's, there's something wrong with the software, something wrong with the hardware, the computer system won't, won't operate. If there's something, if there's an organic problem that we have that impacts our brain, that will impact our behavior and impact our personality. Uh, likewise, you know, if there's issues with our spiritual uh, with uh, we have spiritual issues that will also impact you know our behavior our our personality and that what happens when we have a, a transformation in our spirit uh, when we embrace Christ and we we grow uh, to be more like Christ through discipleship that alters I think the way our brain operates it alters our behavior and our personality so uh, you know so uh, again Neurochemistry and, and, and the foundation of neurochemistry would be ultimately our genetics do impact, do impact us, uh, right, um, uh, in a very real way. But to recognize that isn't to deny our, the immaterial aspect of our nature or our being. Uh, I don't know if that helps, uh, Daniel, if that's what you were getting at. Great, friends. We're going to take about another 10 minutes. Are you okay with that, uh, Dr. Ron? Another 10 minutes of questions? Sure am. So if anybody wants to uh, ask a question, feel free. And if not, we can end 10 minutes early. <laughs> So one last chance here. If anybody has another question for Dr. Rana, feel free to speak up now. And uh, maybe Dr. Rana, why people are um, doing that. Uh, where can we find some of your works? And maybe you want to talk a minute or, or two about some of the books that you've written and where we can find your work at? Sure thing. Um, yeah, if you go to uh, our website, reasons.org, uh, you'll be able to access all kinds of uh, science faith resources, uh, articles, podcasts, videos. We have a YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe One, uh, Reasons to Believe as one word and then the number one. Uh, again, there's all kinds of videos and programming that we have available that explore science faith issues. So that would be a great place to go just to to dabble. I mean, we, we do approach things from a, an old earth creationist perspective, just be aware of that. Um, and then also I've written a, a number of books. Uh, the, the three books that would be most pertinent to what I talked about tonight would be the book Origins of Life, uh, another book called The Cell's Design, and then a book called Creating Life in the Lab. Um, th those would be probably books that I would uh, you know, recommend that you take a look at. And you can get all of those uh, on uh, Amazon, they all are available as Kindle books. And you've done you've done several debates, I believe, as well, right? I know you did a debate with uh, Dr. Michael Ruse, and you've done a few on the Unbelievable podcast as well. Is that right? Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, I actually did a, a debate with Michael Ruse um, uh, that uh, d dealt with the, the question that we're talking about tonight. Also, did a debate with P.Z. Myers, if you're familiar with him. Oh uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, the, yeah, I think those are the two that are the, the most readily available online. Um, and yeah, have appeared on the Unbelievable podcast uh, quite a few times or in the Unbelievable program quite a few times. Will you be a part of the um, virtual conference with the National Conference on Christian Apologetics this year? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I think I am going to be, yeah. Okay. So for those of you, um, the National Conference on Christian Apologetics um, is, you know, due to everything with the pandemic is being moved to an online basis. So um, you can still register online for that. I think it's $35 and it's going to be spread out maybe over a week, I think, or so. Um, but there'll be a lot of great talks in that. So um, you can go to conference.scs.edu for that. Um, your other book, I know we interviewed you on our podcast. Trans, uh, transhumanism, transhumanism 2.0. I thought that was one of the really most fascinating things um, 
that I've read in a long time uh, on the kind of scientific and philosophical uh, issues of, of that whole uh, yeah. discussion with, with transhumanism and that. So I really... Yeah, that, that's a, another topic I've, I've gotten interested in is just the idea of transhumanism. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, a few weeks ago, I, I spent about three and a half hours with uh, uh, several of the people that are the leaders of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. So there's actually a political party uh, called the U.S. Transhumanist Party, and each state uh, also has a state uh, party as well. And uh, and so they uh, invited me to come on, and, and and we actually it's what they called a virtual enlightenment salon. And so we spent three and a half hours talking about. Uh, the relationship between Christianity and transhumanism. It was a, uh, an intense but a fun time. And, and that's actually available on, on YouTube as well. Okay. So if you got three and a half hours to burn, you'd be <laughs> interested in, in, uh, in, in seeing that, that interaction. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's remarkable um, because there's a lot of interesting parallels between transhumanism and, uh, and Christianity. And, and because of those parallels, it becomes almost natural to discuss the gospel mm. uh, with, with somebody who espouses transhumanism. It's, a, it's, it's almost a seamless uh, conversation about the gospel. Uh, and, and, and it never seems to, when I've engaged transhumanists, it never seems to come across as being something where you're, they feel as if you're forcing the gospel on them or something, or, or it's an unnatural you know, discussion of the gospel. It, it just naturally flows out of the themes that are part of transhumanism. Wonderful. So, uh, well, that's great. Uh, that's I, have one, I have a question. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so one of the standard objections raised against older creationism is uh, animal death prior to the fall. Do you have thoughts on that? And also related to that, do you think Adam, as created, was inherently corruptible, subject to death, like second law of thermodynamics? That's kind of what I'm um, wondering about. Uh, we know that he fell. Okay, you know what? I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that question? I had a. Uh, okay. Yeah, my, I had an I had a, a, a an internet glitch. So. Uh, okay. If you could repeat that. So one of the standard problems raised for older creationism is. Uh, animal death prior to the fall of Adam. So I was wondering how you deal with that. But also relatedly, um, do you think Adam was, prior to the fall, um, was he inherently corruptible? Like that, was his body subject to like second law of thermodynamics and so forth? So hypothetically, if he hadn't, um, you know, went through the test, right? It's God just left him. Would, he, would your body eventually decay? You know, but of course he died as a result of um, the sinning, but in a, in a possible world where God just leaves him alone. So I'm kind of wondering about the, what state of the body that Adam originally came from. Was it corruptible but innocent, you know, to be perfected if he had passed the test and so forth? Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, great question. Uh, let me take the second question first. Um, and um, you, I don't know that you uh, you could necessarily make a scriptural argument one way. Okay, friends, I think we, we may have lost uh, Dr. Rana. Uh, I think he's been having some some issues. So, Sean, I know I can, I can recognize your voice, so um, I, can, I can get you uh, connected with Dr. Rana and uh, let you ask him your question there. And um, oh, Debbie, you don't want to take a stab at it? <laughs> I'll, I'll let Dr. Rana. I I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't want to answer for him. Oh, here, he, here he is, I think. Is he back on? Is he back? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he was. Oh, there. Okay, I think so. Been okay. hanging out a minute here. Okay, Dr. Rana. 
see I'm moving. Yeah, my, my uh, yeah. internet connection's going in and out, so. They, so. they wanted me to answer the question for you, so I said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for him to get back. <laughs> I didn't think you'd want my answer, so uh, I, I'll, just, I'll just play it. Yeah, well, uh, let me, I can, I can try real quick to answer the question, and just, I, I, you know, there's just some times of the day where we just have really flaky internet right. connection. Yeah, so, it happens. Uh, so if, if you lose me again, you guys can just call it, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and maybe we can t take up a part two sometime, but yeah, uh, for sure. But but in terms of the idea of you know was Adam you know, created you know incorruptible or you know corruptible? Um, I, I I my personal feeling is that uh, Adam was created spiritually immortal but physically mortal, and 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 part of it is I, I've heard Old Testament scholars argue that the, the idea that Adam was made from the dust of the earth was in, a, in, a, in effect implying Adam's uh, mortality as, a, as his physical mortal, mortality. Uh, and, you know, I think it is interesting that Adam was required access to the, the, uh, to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And you could argue that that access was critical for him to have maintain his um, a, a kind of a provisional immortality in a physical sense. And of course, you know, when, when Adam rebels against God, he's denied access to the tree of life. And it's at that point that death is introduced, you know, into the creation. So I think that Adam would have been subjected to the, the second laws of thermodynamic. But I believe that if he remained in the Garden of Eden and had ongoing access to the tree of life, that he would have had, again, an ongoing physical, um, you know, immortality that would have accompanied his spiritual immortality, and that was again lost as a result of the fall, or as a consequence of the fall. That that's my perspective on it. I don't know that one can make a strong uh, biblical argument for it. Now, now to me, uh, I don't see the the second law of thermodynamics actually being introduced into the creation as a result of the fall but rather I see it as part of the original creation. And, you know, many people, when they think about the second law of thermodynamics, think about it as a, a law of decay, uh, where, you know, things are going from order to disorder. And it is true that whenever any process happens in nature spontaneously, that that process does increase the entropic content of the universe. But, but entropy is really a measure of the quality of energy in the system. It's not really a measure of decay. And, and, and so processes are always happening where you're going from high quality energy to a low quality energy state. So it's, uh, you know, potential energy into heat uh, uh, or it's heat in, from a hot area into a colder area or something like that. Uh, uh, but, you know, for me as a biochemist, um, I actually see entropy as, as actually an organizing force in nature, uh, not as a, a, as a force that drives disorganization and disorder. Uh, and, and the reason why I, I say that is because um, the, when DNA folds into a double helix, when proteins adopt uh, an, a, a three-dimensional structure, when cell membranes spontaneously assemble, that those, organi those processes which are driving order in the system are actually driven, uh, are accompanied by an increase in entropy in the system. And this is due to a phenomena called the hydrophobic effect, which is a bit complicated. Uh, but in other words, I don't necessarily see entropy as being the, the, this, this law of decay, but I actually see it as being a vital part of the laws of nature that, that if it wasn't for entropy, you would not have the capacity for metabolism to happen. You wouldn't have the ability, again, for higher order structures to form in bio, biochemical systems. And so to me, entropy is not a bad thing that would reflect the consequence of the fall, but actually a part of the God's, uh, the, the original design of creation. So, um, so I, I would say, yes, indeed, Adam was subjected to the laws of, of entropy at the time of his creation, that that was actually a really good thing. That if, it, if he wasn't, then he would not exist. 
or no life on earth in fact would exist given the laws of nature. Dr. Rana, would you say the same thing for the expansion of the universe? Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but, but the fact that we actually do see uh, an expanding universe um, means that eventually we're, we're going to, well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what the connection would be between the expansion of the universe and, and entropy. Uh, I'm not sure maybe what you're driving at with that question. I think what I'm driving at is that uh, the second law, yeah, I, I, I think, I, I've been, because I've been thinking this question uh, in the last couple of weeks, about the second law of thermodynamics being a part of creation, not during the fall. But now I'm also thinking, what about the other things happening in the universe, like the rate of expansion, things like that, or the red shift? Would you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you're not going to, again, have stellar burning. Uh, which is critical for life in the universe. You're not going to have stellar burning if it's not for the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Uh, the expansion of the universe is actually driven by some a, a different type of phenomena, not not necessarily entropy. Now, I mean, but the fact that entropy does exist in the universe, and the fact that the universe is expanding means that eventually, because the universe is a closed adiabatic system, it means eventually as the universe expands, the temperature of the universe is gonna to drop to lower and lower temperatures to the point where the universe will eventually experience entropic doom. So one way that we know that the universe must be finite in terms of its extent and existence is the fact that, uh, that, the, that, that it operates according to the second law. Uh, and eventually, I mean, if the universe was eternal, then there would be no life in the universe because uh, because of the expansion of the universe itself. And because of that expansion, you're gonna wind up driving towards entropic doom eventually, unless, uh, unless uh, a creator steps in and intervenes and, and, and replaces this universe with another universe. That's the only hope that, that anybody has for eternal existence uh, is that, that this universe actually will disappear and be replaced by the new heavens and the new earth or a creator must intervene. So, um, yeah, sorry. because I, I was uh, looking at Genesis, I think, 131, when God finished creation, everything was good. So you answered my question that I was thinking that, okay, second law is part of that, that the universe is good. It's part of that, but the expansion probably is not. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you guys so much again for tuning in. And I want to be respectful of Dr. Uh, Rana's time. And so... Uh, hey, Devin, real quick, let me let Joe, um, Dr. Joe Miller's on the lawn. So I wanted him to share real quick um, about next week's discussion around scientific racism um, and that kind of thing. Some of this is uh, somewhat connected. Um, and um, Dr. Dr. Joe, uh, here. a very smart... <laughs> Very, 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 very smart friend. Uh, can you share a little bit about um, what we should be expecting next Tuesday? Well, first, you, I didn't know I was going to be sharing, so I was hiding <laughs> myself. I'm unshaven, sitting in my bedroom, listening to uh, Dr. Rana give his excellent presentation. So, but I'm willing for you because you asked. I'll, 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 I'll look. Thank I'll you. Look for everyone here, but <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm excited. Um, I, I do think a lot of what we're going to talk about next week on. Um, on human personhood, what constitutes that and how that contrasts with especially uh, views from evolution, theistic evolution side of things. I think there's a big difference. Um, and so what I wanna look at is, uh, it, this is connected a lot of some of my current PhD stuff in the idea that I think this idea of a historic Adam and Eve, uh, I think present to us the most coherent argument uh, against racism and for racial reconciliation. Not the only possible argument, but I think it's the most coherent when you consider the scientific, the philosophical, and the theological evidences. Uh, I think that holds true. So I'd like to share with at least a small sliver of that next week. All yeah. right. Thank the you next so week, much. Yep, 8 o'clock Eastern. Yeah, 8 p.m. Eastern again. Same week, same spot. 
Yep. Thank you, guys. Uh, check us out on the Ratio Christie uh, Winthrop YouTube page, and uh, Melissa will get this talk uploaded soon. And Dr. Rana, thanks again for all you do, and uh, God bless. Looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for your time. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rana. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Devin, Melissa. Thank you, Ramon. You, thanks, for, thanks for inviting your, your people. Okay.